question and answer session where you'll be able to ask questions um, of the presenter. This is being recorded and will be available to you um, at the end of the day. Um, for this platform, you do not, as an attendee, have the ability to speak, but you can use the chat box. Those will come to me and I will field your questions and um, anything else that you need uh, during the webinar. Please just communicate with me that way and let me know what you need. You'll also get a PDF copy of the presentation at the end. If you look over to your right um, in the toolbar, you'll see a, an arrow next to handouts. There are two. Um, one is the PDF copy of this presentation and one is um, a brochure template that we'll talk about um, in the presentation. You can download both of those now or I will send them to you um, as email attachments after the webinar ends today. And just for those of you who have not attended one of these before, these are sponsored by NC Growing Together, which is my project, and the North Carolina Rural Center. Um, NC Growing Together is a project at the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. We're hosted um, there with a USDA grant for five years to work on strengthening and expanding local food economies and supply chains across the uh, North Carolina region and coming up with models to do that um, across the nation. So this webinar series is one of the ways that we are trying to um, provide some of these training materials and um, greater understanding of what food and farm businesses need, um, both to food and farm businesses themselves, but also to small business counselors and cooperative extension agents around the state so that they can provide you uh, with more resources when you go take advantage of those services. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Ms. Mavis Gregg, she is an attorney from Durham. Um, she has an extensive amount of experience in heirs property um, and succession planning, and we're really looking forward to hearing uh, a little more about her background and what she's going to present to you today. Thank you, Emily, and thank you for all the you who are attending the webinar. It's my honor to be presenting for North Carolina Growing Together, and I love to talk about heirs property because there are a lot of people in the state of North Carolina who have heirs property and benefit from learning about it and being connected with resources um, to addressing some of the issues with heirs property. As Emily mentioned, I am an attorney. My office is located in Durham. However, I have a footprint across the state of North Carolina. I work with landowners throughout North Carolina, particularly in eastern North Carolina, um, addressing some of the challenges that we'll learn about with heirs property and focusing on economic opportunities with, with heirs property. Um, I also do estate planning and estate administration, so full spectrum um, that will help people maintain and grow their wealth. But today we're going to talk about understanding that we will have a better um, stream if we, we don't have video. So I'm going to turn off the video now. If you have to see my face, I did dress up for you all, but now we'll just be focused on the slides. All right, so heirs property. <clears throat> now, when we're um, throughout this conversation, we're going to have, uh, we'll talk about a, a few different concepts you'll hear over and over again. So I just want to make sure that we all have the same understanding about what these terms mean as we discuss them. The first one is heir. And an heir is a person who inherits from another person after that person passes away. Inherit means to receive property, money, or a title as an heir at the death of the previous holder. Transfer, when we're talking about transfer in, in the context of heirs' property, um, we're talking about the passing of ownership from one person to another. And then a deed, which many of you are probably familiar with, a deed is a legal document used to transfer property ownership from the current owner to the new owner. And typically, and with good reason, the deed is recorded in the Registered Deeds Office in the county where the, pers where the property is located in order to protect the new owner's interest in the land. And this becomes, uh, this is uh, great because it becomes a public legal record, which will be very important, um, as you'll see later in the conversation. And then cooperative. 
a cooperative is a farm or a business that is owned and run jointly by its owners who share the profits and benefits of the, the entity. Now, I, a few weeks ago, I was driving through, I think it was Chatham County, and I saw this great sign that said, Strong Roots, New Growth. And I think that applies well to heirs property. Uh, most people tense up when they hear the term heirs property because this type of land ownership is typically rife with conflict and confusion. However, today I propose that as we learn about heirs property and how to resolve issues related to it, that we think about the strong history land has played in the lives of many families and how land can be a ter terrific resource for new economic opportunities for landowners. So, what is heirs property? Heirs property is a distinctive form of real estate ownership. And three of the characteristics that make heirs property unique are that it's family owned. Um, there are multiple owners, usually more than a few. And then most owners inherited their share from a previous owner rather than buying their share or receiving it as a gift during the previous owner's lifetime. Um, and that's where deeds come into uh, mind. When we think about a deed, that's an actual recorded instrument that reflects the ownership, whereas um, if, a, if, if an interest in a property is inherited, there's not a deed. So property doesn't begin, heirs property doesn't begin as um, uh, having multiple owners and being heirs property, it usually begins with a single owner. So this could be an individual or a couple who buy the property or it is gifted to them. Either way, there's a deed that exists showing the transfer of the property ownership into the name of the original owners. And then after the last original owner passes away, the property goes to their heirs. So if we think about a married couple buying a piece of property, when the last spouse passes away, the property then transfers to the children if there's no will or if there's no deed transferring it at a different time. So here's our, our children. We have a couple, and then we have their four kids. I'm introducing Michael, Sammy, Aretha, and Stevie. Now, all four children become heirs when the last spouse dies. Each of them gets an interest in the property. So one divided by four equals a one-fourth sh share for each child. And we'll explore the legal meaning of this further la uh, later on in the presentation. But right now, I want to note that with most heirs' property, each of the owners are able to transfer their share to whomever they want. And most often, they transfer their share by passing it to their heirs when they die. So our four children each have a one-fourth share. And then um, we're going to see this family tree. This is a family tree, but also representative of how the shares pass. And we're going to see this chart a little bit later, so you don't have to study it too hard. I just want to show you how the ownership evolves over time. Um, this shows you what we end up with with the family tree and with the owners from the beginning with our couple at the top in blue all the way to the present. So each square is a person, each of the colors represents the generation of the family, and the X's indicate that the person is deceased. Again, you don't have to memorize this now, this is going to come, show up a bit later in the presentation. But as you can see, over time, the number of owners multiply. We started off with two, then we go to four, and then we end up with 11, which I'll explain how, uh, like I said, later. Now, in a lot of ways, heirs property, the heirs property ownership model is similar to a housing co-op, which you may be familiar with in places like New York. A co cooperative is the root word. It's jointly owned, and the owners all have a right to occupy and use the real estate. The value behind this joint ownership is that it's a resource for the benefit of all the owners. And it's really important that we keep that in mind, especially when we talk about heirs' property and when we're talking with families that own heirs' property. And there are a lot of benefits to having a family cooperative land, uh, family-centered cooperative land ownership model. Um, and these benefits are pretty obvious, but I'll just point those out to you. 
Um, first of all, the land is a source of family legacy that can be used over multiple generations and be a source of inter intergenerational wealth. It's also a source of stability, particularly economic stability. Some heirs property can be used to grow and raise food for the family. That food can also be a source of income for the family if they sell it. Um, and, and what I'm thinking about in this context is if they're farmers, if they're using the, the land to raise food to sell. It can also be used as collateral for financing. So again, if you have a business operation connected with the land, that land could be leveraged for financing to um, buy supplies, buy um, materials, equipment to continue the family farm. Um, and also, this applies to forestry. If you have land with trees, it can be used for timber over multiple generations if it's properly managed. Family-owned property can also be a benefit to the local community, which I think we don't um, often think about when we're talking about heirs property, but it can have a significant benefit to the local community. Uh, in addition to being a part of the local food system, land ownership generally has a strong connection to political representation and pooled community resources, especially in rural areas. Now, this concept of um, family cooperative land ownership practice, or I don't think think many people know. Um, this is in Bougainville, which is in the South Pacific, so it's close to Australia. And then we also see it in Tanzania, which is in Ivana in West Africa, and then the United States. And there are a few examples of where we see land ownership. Um, so these are a few examples of where we see land ownership um, passing through familial lines and used for intergenerational wealth and stability. The two places that we see it in the United States are Hawaii and the southeastern United States. So in Hawaii, property was passed from generation to generation by familial and tribal right for many, many years. And then we see this in the southeastern United States. And this is what we were referring to as heirs property. And heirs' property in the southeastern United States is mostly in rural land that has been and perhaps continues to be used for farming and timber purposes. Most, for most heirs' property owners, the land is in a place for home, an actual home, food and shelter is a key part of that. But it's also a source of food and income for the owners. And most of the heirs' property owners in the United States are African-American families. Now, remember, the term heirs' property refers to the fact that most of the owners of the single piece of property inherited their share. So going back to our chart, this is what we see. Um, the legal structure of heirs' property is very unique from other top types of land ownership, and it presents some significant vulnerabilities. So remember our, our family tree from earlier? So we have the original owners at the top in blue, and then each square is a person. Each of the colors represent the generation of the family, and the X's indicate that the person is deceased. Now, in the second generation, you see the, the orangish, orangish color, um, and we have two blocks per uh, sibling. The bottom block that's a little bit shaded represents a spouse. So we have of our four children, three got married, and then all of them had children, and two of them have grandchildren. And so if we look at, if we consider that the ones in X's are deceased, um, the ones that don't have X's are alive and are current owners, that leaves us with 11 owners, which include the spouse of a deceased child of one of the original owners. And then there's five potential owners at a minimum. That would be the folks in the blue at the bottom who are potential owners. So that's a lot of owners. That's a lot of people that are involved. So let's look at the legal structure of heirs' property and the vulnerabilities. Um, it's very unique from, from other types of land ownership. Now, there's multiple owners, and these owners own the property as what's called tenants in common. This means each owner has a share in the property and a right to the 
whole property like all the other owners. However, there are no rights of survivorship like we see with joint tenancy with rights of survivorship. You might be familiar with the term of joint tenancies with rights of survivorship as the way that a husband and wife own property. Well, with tenants in common, there are no rights of survivorship amongst the tenants. Their share passes to their heirs. Because the owners are tenants in common, each of them ha can transfer their shares to whomever they want. So they can do this while they're alive. They can also transfer the share upon their death to their heirs. But you know, the, the big concern is that they can transfer it to a third party who then has rights with the property just like all the other owners. And then this type of ownership requires that decision making be unanimous. Even though a single owner can transfer her share while um, you know, to anyone that she wants, all the owners must agree to sell the to sell the entire property, to borrow against the property, to do any type of legal um, contract or decision. It must be unanimous amongst all the owners. So, thinking about our example where we have eleven owners, multiple generations, different levels of interest that could become problematic. In fact, all of, these, um, all of these characteristics of the legal structure of heirs' property present significant challenges to the owners. So let's look at those challenges a little bit closer. So even with the challenges of heirs, and even though, um, even though there are challenges with heirs' property, I think it's important for us to remember as service providers and as owners um, that there are a lot of benefits to land ownership, particularly for people who rely on land for income or for their home or for intergenerational wealth. It's definitely important that we keep that in mind. Also, in some areas, the loss of family-owned land can have a significant negative impact on the local community if that property goes to large developers or outsiders, for example. So it's really, uh, we're going to talk about some significant challenges, but I think it's important that we keep in mind that um, the, the alternative to having land ownership in families is also dire. So what are the legal challenges? Again, owners can transfer their share, their shares to whomever they want, including outsiders. Most often, owners transfer their shares by death. And when this happens, there's no predictability in who is going to be an owner and how many owners there are going to be. So that leaves us with the complex, restrictive structure of ownership and, has, and creates a lot of vulnerabilities in the land. <clears throat> oh, my slide turned out different, so <laughs> let me just make sure I... Um, there are also social challenges to heirs' property ownership. It's a significant source of conflict within families because you have various interests and different values in the land. The family dynamic can really play a part in how well the co-owners get along, and so that presents a challenge. There are also financial challenges. Um, it can be costly to keep land, and then not all the owners will necessarily participate in, in, in contributing their part um, to upkeeping the land and paying the taxes, if there's a mortgage, paying the mortgage, if there's any, um, any improvements that need to be made. So it can be very costly, especially if, you're, if you didn't intend to become an owner of the property. And then there's also the challenge of access to resources. Many people simply don't know how to get help with dealing with the challenges of heirs' property, and that's where uh, we as service providers come in. So how do we address the challenges? Now, I um, pointed out four different cha challenges, legal structure, the social challenges, financial, and then access to resources. Let's look at addressing the legal challenges. And this is where um, I, as a lawyer, come in and help people who own heirs' property. The f there's four significant steps when addressing the legal challenges. And that's really important for heirs' property owners and service providers to understand that we don't have to address all of them at the same time. In fact, it's not really possible to do that. Um, we want to look at it in stages, starting with the family tree. And you saw in the earlier chart where we laid out what the family tree looked like. Well, in that, we'll take that same example and just fill in the blanks and put in the people's names, when they died, where they died, were they married, 
and did they have children? And this is something that the owners can be involved with, and it doesn't have to be all the owners at the same time. It can be one owner or a couple of owners, but getting involved with developing the family tree. And that family tree is very significant in addressing the legal challenges because the next step, the next stage in addressing the legal challenges is to do what's called a title search. And that's where a lawyer comes into um, play. When we, the reason why we want to do a title search, first of all, is we want to have a history of the property transferring from the original owners to the current owners. And then we also want to identify who those current owners are so that we can know who can be involved with making any type of decisions with the property. So once we have the family tree, we go to a lawyer who will do a title search and trace the ownership of the property from the beginning where with our original owners all the way to the present. And then we go to the next stage, which is owner decision making. And this involves all the owners of record. This, once we have the title search and confirmed who the, rec the re record owners are, those people are the parties that need to be involved in the decision making. And in my opinion as an attorney, this is the most crucial part of the process because one, one, we need to get a unanimous decision, but two, it's an opportunity to get owners involved and engaged with the land and also do some healing with relationships. Remember, heirs' property has, is often a source of significant conflict, and so this is an opportunity to address some of those things. And it can involve an attorney, but it can also involve a neutral third party who is skilled with conflict resolution, such as mediation. Um, and then once we um, go through that, start go through that phase and get people talking, then we want to look at what the new ownership structure is. Now, ideally, the family will keep the land, um, whether it's all the current owners or a mix of some of the current owners, but they will keep the land in the family, but have a new ownership structure that eliminates some of the challenges that we discussed where we aren't having multiple owners requiring unanimous decision making. There's predictability with who's going to be benefiting from the land, who's going to use the land, what's going to happen to the land in the future. And we're not going to go into too deep in depth with that today, but what I will say is that there are different mechanisms that you can use to create a new ownership structure. One of them is a trust. A trust is an actual legal entity that is designed to own property. And there's different reasons for using trust. You've probably heard about trust in the context of saving money um, on taxes, estate taxes, which most Americans don't qualify for estate taxes. Owning family land is another reason why you would want to use a trust. And so you create a trust and you transfer the land into the trust and then you appoint a person who would be the trustee. That's a fiduciary role. Their sole responsibility is to manage the property, to make any decisions on the property, to ensure that the property stays protected and for the benefit of the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries are the folks that get to as it sounds, benefit from the use of the property. Um, and that typically with heirs property is your family members or the lineal descendants of the original owner. So anyone who is a blood descendant of the original owners could be a beneficiary of the trust. Another option for a new ownership structure is a limited liability company or LLC. This is also a legal entity and it's again it's formed to hold the property and you can set up your own rules for how the property is managed. If all the owners transfer the, prop, the real estate into the, the limited liability company, um, they become members of the limited liability company. And you file this document with the Sec Secretary of State of North Carolina, and then you have what's called an operating agreement. The operating agreement dictates how the property is managed. You can appoint a manager or managers, and then you can also state who 
um, who can use the property, how they can use the property, if any member wants to sell their share, how that's done. You can include a first right of refusal. You can create rules that work for your property, management rules that work for your specific circumstances that don't require unanimous decision making. It can, it can be set out in the operating agreement or it can say that the owners have to have a majority vote. There's a lot of different ways that you can structure the LLC or a trust that, that um, do away with the limitations that we talked about and do away with the complexity. Um, that that phase of once the parties have this, once the owners are going to do with the property, um, what type of new ownership structure they're going to have, that's when we bring a lawyer back into the picture because a lawyer will have to draft the documents that will create the trust or create the LLC and then also the deed that would need to be signed by all of the owners um, to transfer the property into the um, new entity. And just a little side note, with that deed transferring the property, whether you're transferring the property to one human owner or to the um, trust or LLC, all of the owners will have to sign the document. And that's that, again, that's going to be a challenge, but it's definitely something that can be accomplished. And any married owner will have to, their spouse will have to sign the deed as well, not because they're an owner, but because they have a future interest. So potentially there could be a lot of people that need to sign the deed to transfer the property, uh, and I just want to point that out. I also want to point out that um, with respect to legal challenges, you may not get to stage four. You may only get to stage three where you're having the conversation. And I think it's important for individual owners, people who are part of heirs' property, there are things that you can do on your own to um, mitigate the dam not mitigate the damages, but mitigate the potential um, complications of the heirs' property. And that's dealing with your own estate plan. A lot of times people won't, um, have a will. Most Americans don't have wills, um, but wills are very helpful in creating um, creating a definite idea of where property is going to go, including your real estate. Now, I don't suggest that you get a simple will. A simple will basically will say your property goes to all my kids, or to my spouse, and then to all my kids. That actually does not uh, help when we're talking about heirs property. It actually creates the same type of circumstances as heirs property. So you need more than a simple will. You need to sit down with an attorney who is skilled in estate planning, who focuses, whose practice focuses on estate planning, and talk about what your different assets are and whether or not it makes sense to give all of your real estate to all of your children, or if there's a way to divvy up um, the bucket of assets in a way that shows that you love your children equally, but that you're giving differently to ensure that they don't have conflict. Definitely want to keep that in mind when we're addressing the legal issues and keeping that in mind when, you know, even if you're not working with the whole set of heirs property owners um, that you co-own with, that you're addressing that with your own share, not creating additional owners for that, that family tree. Addressing the social and financial challenges, owners need to get more informed about heirs' property. A lot of people don't, just don't know about how it works from a legal standpoint or what it means. A lot of people assume that property, real estate, only passes to blood descendants, and that's not true. Um, the fact is, if you're married and have kids, then your real estate potentially and most likely goes to your spouse and your children. Um, so owners just need to get more informed. And I also strongly advocate for the use of mediation. Again, me mediation is a form of dispute resolution where you involve a neutral third party whose job is to facilitate conversation between the parties and help people express what their interests are um, and brainstorm ways to resolve the, the challenges. And it doesn't require involving a judge or a jury. It's much less expensive than going to court. Um, and 
I also recommend that we address the, the social and financial um, issues and stages. Uh, it can be very expensive to try to um, tackle all of this at once. But if you address it in stages and also keep in mind um, kind of what your limits are and what you want to put into addressing the issues, then you can manage it from an economic standpoint much better. Now, how do we address access to resources? That's an important issue. A lot of people can't afford an attorney. A lot of people can't afford to go out and find all this information on their own, and that's where we as third-party service providers can help. Um, one is just to provide basic information. Emily mentioned that there will be a template sent with a brochure that I've drafted up, and that brochure you can um, input your agency's information in the brochure, but it includes just some basic information about heirs property and the four stages of addressing heirs property. Um, you can also just be aware of what the resources are that are available in, in your community and connect the landowners to those resources. Um, that includes knowing who the different attorneys are who work in real estate and estate planning. I don't recommend um, just go into an attorney based on their fees. It should be an attorney who actually has skills in dealing with estate planning, in dealing with estate administration, and dealing with real estate. Um, and then host learning and networking events for heirs property owners, just like this program. Um, this is a great way to expand the knowledge of landowners about heirs property and to allow them to network with other owners. Sometimes it's helpful just to know that there are other people who have lands, that family lands, they can talk about the stories of the family land and where it came from and, and how it was used in the family. It can be a great resource. Now, my suggestion with um, working with, with, with developing the resources for your um, constituents is to do some what I call asset mapping. So a asset mapping is basically a visual that shows what the different resources are in your community um, for a particular subject. So in this context, we're talking about heirs property resources. Um, I just put Durham County in there because that's where I live. Um, but creating an asset map will help help you visualize who are all the different resources available in your community and beyond that can be helpful to heirs property owners. So at the center, we have our, our core, the heirs property resource. Um, and then we have four branches. We have legal, institutions, government, businesses, and organizations. So for legal, of course, we want attorneys. Who are the attorneys that do the heirs, I mean, the estate planning, estate administration, uh, real estate? Um, who are the attorneys that are knowledgeable enough about heirs property to do presentations on heirs property in your community? Um, and then looking at institutions, um, the co-op extension, faith-based groups, um, definitely can rely on faith-based groups and civic groups to provide connections to landowners, to provide even space to host events, um, to collaborate with on educating. And then universities often have resources that are available for, for people in the community. And the government, I, meant, I just mentioned generically local, state, federal government, but every um, government on each of those levels has programs for people in the community or for their constituents, you know, whether it's USDA or the North Carolina Department of Agriculture or some entity within the local municip municipality. Um, but identifying the government resources is also very helpful. And then businesses and organizations, and there's so many different ones that you can look to as a resource. So appraisers come in handy because a lot of times landowners just don't know how much their property is worth. You might rely on the tax value, but an appraised value um, given the market rate is, is very helpful. Mediators, um, a lot of times there's community mediation centers in your area, if not in your town, in your region. Community mediation services uh, often are on a sliding scale basis and can be a huge cost savings and just a great opportunity to have positive conversation. Surveyors, realtors, genealogists, um, 
family trees are fun, but they're also challenging. I'm I'll, I'm even challenged with doing family trees. I use Ancestry.com, but I also rely on to help map out who people are and how to find access to the records. Because again, when we're doing that title search, um, we need to know when the person passed away and where they live. Uh, a lot of times, our owners, um, our heirs' property owners, live out of the have lived out of the state. Um, whether it's in Virginia or um, uh, D.C., Maryland, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. What I've found in my practice is a lot of the owners have um, lived in other states and other counties, and so it's helpful to identify that and use a genealogist to help figure that out. And then land trust, um, that's just one example of an organization that can be helpful to heirs property owners when we're thinking about the economic opportunities, uh, such as forestry or land conservation easements. That can, a land conservation easement is where you are giving the land trust um, an easement onto the land to restrict the development of the land, to keep it as farmland or to keep it as a forest, but definitely not developing into um, say, a uh, residential community or, or something like that. And it provides some uh, a source of cash flow because that's something that the land trust would pay for. Um, so identifying land trust organization, um, identifying foresters. A lot of times people have forests and they don't know how to uh, manage the forest, and so how do they? How do you learn about managing a forest, and who can you hire? Well, a forester is an example. A professional forester, they can help design a forest management plan. Um, those those are different assets that you want to, or yeah, assets that you want to include on your asset map as a service provider. And then looking at asset mapping for owners is also something that you could consider. Um, a lot of times people just feel so overwhelmed with all the information that's out there once they do get connected. And so you can also help landowners with connecting to their own assets. So it's a similar um, uh, model. We have, again, property uh, in the center. And then we have uh, legal institutions, government, businesses, and organizations, but then we also have the land. And sometimes people just haven't thought about their land as an asset. They've thought about it as a burden, or they thought about it as something that they have to address. But helping landowners think about their land as an asset and understand what their land has to offer can help open their minds up to how their land can be used for economic opportunity. So I just put some generic terms on here, like what type of soil it has, whether or not it's close to a water source, what type of sun exposure, um, the value of the land. There's probably other qualities. I am not a farmer or a horticulturalist. <laughs> I can't even say the word. <laughs> um, but what I can say is that uh, it's important for people to understand the characteristics of their land, because all land is unique. Um, but then also just helping points out the different resources for the owners in their community that they can reach out to so that they have an easy guide to getting to their land. And that's my slide. Thank you very much. I want to um, provide enough time for us to answer questions. I know that we did get one question yesterday uh, in advance. Someone was very excited to to learn more, so I want to address your questions and have plenty of time for that. Um, there are some things that I didn't discuss today because they are pretty adept too. Um, for example, what are the alternatives to not addressing the land, uh, the ownership model, where we have uh, numerous owners and that continues to grow? One of the alternatives is to do nothing, but that only further, um, uh, that only deepens Rather, that only deepens the vulnerabilities of heirs' property. Um, and another alternative is to rely on the court system to address the challenges of heirs' property. And by that, I mean uh, partition sale, which means that some one of the landowners will go to the court and say, you know what, we have this land together. We want it to be divided. We want you, the court, a third party, to decide 
how this land is divided up and who gets what. And that's a very expensive litigation proceeding, and it takes the power out of the hands of the owners. If the land can't be divided up equally, for example, if the land is too small or if the characteristics are so unique that it's hard for a third-party judge to divide it up equally, then the, the alternative to a partition is a sale in lieu of partition. And what that means is that they put it up on the auction block just like a foreclosure and anybody can come and buy the land and most often it's not the landowners. Most often the price that it sells at for auction is higher than what the individual landowners can afford, um, but much lower than the market value. And so the third parties can come in and get some valuable um, intergenerational family lands um, for a bargain, and that that's not good. Um, yeah, so questions. I know we have one question on saving taxes. Um, our participant asked whether or not it makes sense to transfer the land to their the farmland to their children now while they're alive or wait until or to have it transfer at death. Um, and my first response to that question is that it's very important to meet with an attorney, um, even talk to your accountant. If you have an operating farm, hopefully you are already working with a with an accountant, um, but it's important to talk to a professional about your specific circumstances and so that you can make the best plan for your circumstances. And of course, talk to your children because maybe your children don't want the land, but hopefully you've already had that conversation. Um, but when we're thinking about saving on taxes with respect to transfers to children, um, <clears throat> there's two things that you have to think about, the basis and the sales price. So the basis is the value of the property on the date of the transfer, and then the sales price, of course, is what the um, how much it goes for when it's sold. So if you transfer property to your children while you're alive, that the date of that transfer becomes the basis. And if they sell that property later, what the math that we are looking at for tax purposes is um, the sales price on the date that your children sell the price uh, sell the property and the basis from the date that you transfer it when they're alive. So um, it may not be that obvious, but the basis would be much higher if it's based on your date of death rather than sometime in your life because you don't know when you're going to pass away. So for example, let's say that your property is worth 100000 now, I'm just using low numbers because I'm also not a mathematician. But let's just say that you your property today is worth $100,000 and you're 65 years old. Um, you could possibly be around for another 25 years. And let's say that you transfer the property to your children today while it's worth $100,000, and then you die when you're 90 and the property value has tripled. Well, the, let's say 300000 minus 100000 they're paying taxes on 200000 Whereas if you transfer on death, and that means the basis is 300000 and say your children sell it right away, there's minimal gains. There's not a lot of gains on that property because the date of death value is so close to the sales price um, they, given when they've sold it. So the, the simple answer is that you run the risk of, of increasing the amount that is taxable if you transfer it while you're alive. There are alternatives to what I just described, alternatives to just a straight transfer while you're alive. Um, for example, if you were to transfer a friendly property into an LLC, while you're alive, while you're still the owners, but then make your children members, so in a sense co-owners, but giving them only a small percentage of ownership value in the LLC, then we're just looking at that small amount, and then you you can there's a um, you can increase their ownership from year to year, so that you're gradually giving them full ownership of the property, but you're minimizing the taxable events each year. Hopefully that makes sense. I can't see you guys nodding your heads. So. <laughs> 
I don't know. Do we have any other questions? I can't, um, I don't know where I, where do I see the questions? Oh, okay, everyone feels ready to go to law school and has all their um, prerequisites based on this one presentation. Do you want to talk about the Okay. Yeah. Um, hey, everyone. This is Emily. Um, before we close up, I just wanted to let you know about the next webinars in the series that are coming up, um, one on July 18th, which is about how to host a food and farm training program for entrepreneurship in your region with your community college and your extension center, um, and also one on August 10th with the Secretary of State's office on some new laws around crowdfunding. So as Mavis said, we will get you guys ready for law school before this is all over. Um, in the meantime, if you have further questions for um, Mavis, please feel free to shoot us an email. You should all have contact information for us, and I will also be in touch um, in the next 24 hours once the video goes live to YouTube. I'll send you a link and a copy of the presentation and the brochure that you can make up. Do you have anything else, Mavis? All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending today. We really appreciate it, and we look forward to catching up with you again soon.